The Security Council met this morning on South Sudan. Briefing council members in person, the Secretary General's special representative, Nicholas Haysom, said there had been both progress and reduced momentum in advancing the revitalized peace agreement in the country. He pointed to positive developments, such as the fifth National Governors Forum late last month, which marked the first high-level meeting of all members of government since the signing of the peace agreement in 2014. But Mr. Hasem said that while the steps taken so far in the implementation of the revitalized peace agreement are welcome, they're not sufficient if the peace process is to be sustained. He stressed the need for progress to be made regarding next year's elections and on the Constitution, and he expressed concern over the restrictions on civic space. Also addressing council members today was Wafa Saeed, the director of the Coordination Division in the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. She said that the people of South Sudan have faced the highest levels of food insecurity since independence in 2011 and the renewed conflict, which began in 2013. She said that between April and July 2021, 7.2 million people were estimated to be at crisis phase, of which 2.4 million are at emergency phase. Rosemary DiCarlo, the Undersecretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, briefed the Security Council yesterday afternoon on Iran and the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. She reiterated the Secretary General's point that there is simply no viable alternative to the full and effective implementation of that plan of action. In this regard, together with the Secretary General, Under Secretary General DiCarlo appealed to the United States to lift or waive sanctions as outlined in the plan and extend the waivers regarding the trade and oil with Iran. She also called on Iran to reverse the steps it has taken that are not consistent with its nuclear-related commitments under the plan. Turning to Syria, an estimated 3.4 million people need humanitarian assistance in the Northwest. Ongoing conflict in some areas, the economic crisis, COVID-19, and difficult winter conditions are increasing needs. All response modalities are needed to assist people in need. Aid must also be delivered in a more sustainable manner. The UN has an operational plan to send regular and predictable deliveries of assistance from areas under government of Syria control across conflict lines to reach the Northwest. Two convoys of 14 trucks each have already moved assistance cross line to a warehouse in Idlib. Distribution of the cross line aid is expected to begin in the second half of December. Cross line convoys, even if deployed regularly, cannot replicate the size and scope of the cross border operation. They are, however, an important complement to the massive cross-border operation, offering another avenue for aid to be delivered to people in need in Northwest Syria. Moving to Afghanistan, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that the World Food Program provided food to almost 150,000 people in Badakhshan, Takhar, Kandahar, Helmand, and Urzgan provinces on Monday. In Badakhshan, Kabul, Banshir, and Kunduz provinces close to 6,000 people also received cash assistance on the same day. Our humanitarian colleagues also tell us that yesterday, four civilians were reportedly injured after an unexploded ordinance detonated in Garmsir district, Helmand province. Also yesterday, an unconfirmed number of civilian casualties were reported with an improvised explosive device detonated inside a mosque in Shinwari district, Nangahar province. On the liquidity crisis, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that 100 food shops and commercial businesses remain closed in Jalalabad city due to the devaluation of the local currency and high food and commodity prices. In 2021, donors have provided nearly $1.5 billion for the two humanitarian appeals for Afghanistan. Next year's humanitarian response plan seeks three times the funding required this year. $4.4 billion to reach 22 million people with support. Continuing on Afghanistan, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization today said that as of the 30th of November, it has directly supported 2.23 million people in 2021, across 31 out of Afghanistan's 34 provinces. More than 800,000 people were assisted in November alone. Through the winter wheat campaign, FAO provided wheat seeds across 30 provinces of Afghanistan. When completed by the end of December, the campaign will have assisted 1.3 million people, enabling farmers to produce enough wheat to cover the cereal needs of 1.7 million people for one year. FAO warns that prices are soaring and humanitarian needs keep growing and continue to be far greater than resources. For the 2022 spring response, FAO urgently needs 
$115.3 million to deliver humanitarian assistance to farmers and herders. Turning to Haiti, we can report that in response to yesterday's deadly fuel truck explosion in Capatien, the UN Humanitarian Air Services, Haitian and other humanitarian air assets are working under the coordination of the country's authorities to transport medical personnel and supplies. Under the leadership of the Health Ministry and the Civil Protection Agency, humanitarian partners are, lo are supporting local emergency care providers who report a need for medical personnel and supplies to treat severe burns. Priority supplies include serums, gauze, and other items. National authorities are still assessing the number of people injured or killed in yesterday's explosion, but numbers available now indicate that at least 61 people died and about 50 people were injured in the blast. Vehicles, motorcycles, and 20 houses near the site of the explosion also caught fire, raising fears of a higher death toll. The city's hospitals are overwhelmed with injured people, most of whom are being treated in courtyards due to a lack of hospital beds. Our humanitarian colleagues are supporting coordination by liaising between medical practitioners, air and logistics operators. Haiti's interim prime minister, Ariel Henry, has declared three days of national mourning. And I have a COVID update for you today from Nicaragua, which received more than 800,000 vaccine doses through COVAX that have been donated by France to vaccinate pregnant women, postpartum women, and mothers who are exclusively breastfeeding. This latest delivery brings the total number of doses that Nicaragua has received from COVAX to nearly 4 million. And tomorrow at 11 a.m., there will be a briefing by the UN Resident and Humanitarian Coordinator for Yemen, David Gressley. And that is it uh, for me. I'm going to have a little sip of water, and then I will take your questions. All right, first of all, uh, uh, please, uh, if, if you can turn the cameras to the room so I can see whether there's any hands up in the room. Uh, oh, uh, yes, Kristen, Kristen Salami. Hi, Farhan, thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, if there's any reaction from the Secretary General on the agreement between Iran and the IAEA regarding allowing the cameras to be turned back on again in their uh, main nuclear facility. Uh, apparently, my understanding of the agreement is that the cameras will be recording again, but they're not going to share that footage with the IAEA until the United States comes back to the deal. Is that good enough? Do you have any reaction? Is that helpful, useful? Uh, yes, we were in touch with our colleagues at the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, and they are studying uh, this response. Um, and uh, and we will, we'll first wait to, to hear from them what their reaction is to this. Uh, for our part, of course, uh, uh, we would welcome any efforts uh, uh, by Iran to deal uh, constructively with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, as I said, uh, Ms. DiCarlo made clear that we want uh, Iran to comply with all the nuclear-related aspects of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, and uh, we certainly want them to cooperate fully with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, okay, uh, Pam Falk, you have a question? Sorry. Um, yes, uh, on the Friday, thank you, Farhan. On the Friday, uh, Ethiopia special meeting of the UN Human Rights Council. Will the Secretary General participate or someone from UN headquarters? And what do you expect to come out of it? Thank you. Well, uh, we'll, we'll leave it to our, um, our colleagues in the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to deal with what they want to come out of the uh, Human Rights Council meeting. Uh, obviously, it's very um, important uh, that uh, the human rights situation in Ethiopia be examined and examined thoroughly. Uh, I, I, I don't, um, I, I don't uh, have any um, uh, confirmation of any participation by the Secretary General on that. And indeed, we may have announcements about his uh, future program in the coming days to announce uh, a little bit uh, farther down the line. But, uh, but there's nothing to announce just yet on, uh, on what he's doing. And I'm sorry, as a follow-up on that, 
Uh, can you give any updates on the trucks and the fuel that had been uh, uh, confiscated and the fuel deliveries uh, stopped to Tigray? Well, we we've been uh, in touch with our humanitarian colleagues. There there uh, there has been progress in terms of uh, of getting food in, but fuel remains a problem. Uh, but certain things, in, including food and uh, medicines for malaria, have been coming in. Um, but until we have a regular supply of fuel coming in, it's hard to distribute it uh, uh, to all the places it needs to go. So so we're continuing to be in touch with the authorities, and we're trying the best we can to make sure that we are able to, to uh, deliver to all the places we need to go. Thank uh, you, sir. Thanks. Uh, James Reinald? Hi, Farhan. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Oh, great, thanks. Yeah, um, the U.S. Um, released information today about a ten million dollar deal between Mali, uh, welcoming the uh, Wagner uh, mercenary outfit uh, into the country. Um, is this something that the UN has any information on? And also, is it something that part of your apparatus, for example, the human rights team in Geneva or the panel of experts, might be monitoring? Uh, I, I don't have any uh, comment on this latest uh, development. Uh... Uh, we've made uh, clear what our concerns are about uh, about the presence of foreign mercenaries, and that position uh, remains unchanged. Uh, Joe Klein? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, you, uh, you mentioned some comments from under Secretary uh, DiCarlo. Uh, in light of the fact that uh, the Iranian regime is insisting that the United States uh, remove all sanctions up front before it begins to negotiate any concessions. Um, does the undersecretary have any uh, thoughts about whether the United States should make uh, any moves first in removing any of these sanctions that are now imposed to uh, incentivize Iran to uh, also make concessions? Or should these be done simultaneously? Um, as confidence building, just give us a little bit more detail on uh, in context of what she has in mind in terms of what she's calling upon the United States to do. Well, uh, regarding that, I, I think um, uh, I don't know whether you heard it, but at the top of the briefing, I mentioned uh, what she said in her briefing, where she made clear that she and the Secretary General both appealed to the United States to lift or waive its sanctions, as outlined in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, and extend the waivers regarding the trade and oil with Iran. And on Iran's side, she is called, as has the Secretary General, on Iran to reverse the steps it's taken that are not consistent with its nuclear-related commitments on the land. And of course, uh, I believe we've provided uh, the full transcript of what she said, and, and, uh, I, and that uh, goes into the details about what we want to see. No, I, I understand that. But I'm trying to drill down a little further because uh, the question is sequence here. Iran is insisting that the United States go first, not only to remove some of the sanctions, but all the sanctions. So even if we're talking about any of the sanctions you just mentioned, oil, waivers, and so forth, uh, to break the logjam, she and the Secretary General believe that the United States, through from the JCPOA, should move first? That's my question. Evan. Yeah, and, and regarding that, obviously the parties themselves are in discussions and we're leaving them to discuss further how they will deal with this. Uh, what our guiding principles are and, and what we want to see out of this have been spelled out very clearly by Rosemary DiCarlo, and I'd refer you back to what she said. Uh, Abdul Hamid. Thank you, Farhan. You know, the tension between the Russian Federation and Ukraine is growing higher and higher. Is the UN Secretary General involved in any way? Did he try to contact the parties? Is he doing anything on that crisis? Well, what, what we're doing, we're not directly involved in this, but we have been urging all concerned parties to remain focused on resolving um, uh, differences through dialogue at all levels, de-escalating tensions, and safeguarding regional peace. 
We remind all stakeholders of their responsibility to ensure a peaceful settlement of the conflict in accordance with the Minsk agreements as endorsed by the Security Council in its resolution 2202. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, I see no further questions, so uh, I will turn the floor over to the spokesperson for the President of the General Assembly, Paulina Kubiak. Paulina, over to you.